Um, this is MongoDB, uh, you know, brief introduction. I, uh, my name is, my nickname is Waldo, but if you need to find me professionally, I'm Harold Grunenwald. Um, I self-identify as a geek. I get off on solving problems. And I found that the career of systems engineering and teaching myself to code have given me lots of areas to find cool problems to solve. Um, on Twitter, I'm a git. I'm G Waldo, and also on GitHub. If you want to follow along, I've um, done my best to publish a the conference schedule as as best I could put it together in JSON fo uh, format, and it's up there under uh, a repo called Nelf 2013, all uppercase, no spaces. Um, quick caveats: I have no affiliation with Tengen. Um, I know some of the people there; they're awesome, uh, but I don't. Uh, I don't, I'm not being paid for them, though they did offer me a t-shirt. Um, on language, I'm going to try to keep it clean, but I am an ex-Marine of 10 years, uh, eight years, and so it's kind of how I talk. So I will try to be nice. I apologize in advance. Uh, but what is MongoDB? Uh, it comes from the name of humongous for being able to scale to handle huge data sets. Um, basically, the founders of MongoDB were trying to make Google App Engine, and then uh, Google App Engine happened. Google released it, and they went, well, what now? Uh, so they cried in their beers for a few days and picked up, looked at the parts that they had put together to see if there was anything salvageable. And they said, well, you know, our data model is kind of cool. We can do an a database of arbitrary JSON. Let's, let's polish that up and ship it. So, as I said, it's, uh, you know, the data resembles JSON. It's actually BSON, binary formatted. Uh, if you want more information, uh, there's a website, bsonspec.org, that describes exactly how it is. But you can think about it as JSON. Um, another, you know, it has a lot of common features that you expect out of any real database. Uh, it does indexing, querying, you know, it's no use putting data in if you can't get it out. You know, this is what a very simple query looks like. Um, you can do replication and sharding, and both of those are stupid simple to set up. Really easy to get going if once you start needing to put it into production. Um, to, as part of write production, going from memory to disk, you can enable journaling. It's actually enabled by default. It didn't used to be as of version 2.0. Um, you can set write concern for when you have when you have your replica sets. You want to ensure that if um, your write to the database doesn't return OK until it's reached n number of your secondaries. Um, you can do um, stored procedures and just plain old JavaScript and calling them is about as simple as you'd expect. Um, it, it seriously has a lot of features. Um, there, are, you know, one of the criticisms that skipping ahead, it doesn't do everything that a database like you know, MS SQL or MySQL or Oracle. It doesn't have all the features that they have because it hasn't been around that long. But seriously, there are a lot of features. And there's a lot of awesome built into a uh, pretty small footprint, at time and size wise. So MongoDB is a document database, and we're not talking about PDFs or HTML or uh, or Word docs. You're you're inputting arbitrary JSON objects, um, and you can think of those if you're not familiar with them. You can think of them as um, Ruby and Perl arrays. I could be reading this um, PHP or, or I'm sorry, Ruby and Perl hashes, Python dicks, dictionaries, and uh, PHP arrays. Um, it's open source. They do all their coding in public. Um, and this goes for all their projects. It, the server, the, the client, um, any number of tools. They've published a lot of like just add-on tools, like some monitoring apps. Their documentation is a repo. Um, it's all under AGPL, but if you want a commercial license, that can be provided to you. And they love contributions. Um, it's very performant. It has a relatively low memory footprint just to, you know, to be running until, um, unlike 
it take, they decided to not solve the problem of how do we handle memory management. They let the kernel do that. Uh, I didn't mention platforms. It runs on it runs on the Unix families, including of course Linux and Mac. Uh, it can run on Windows, but why would you? Um, and it has, of course, clients for all of. Um, it's, it is recommended that you run on 64-bit and not 32 because you hit caps pretty at relatively small sizes. Uh, I think it, I think it stops working. It doesn't work after two gigs of a data set. But other than that, when you're on your 64-bit server, it is very, very scalable. Um, it, um, it's full featured. It, any kind of a query that you would expect to be able to make, you can make. Uh, it does complex. Um, you can use complex indexes. You can query for multiple properties. You can choose to return or return or ignore arbitrary numbers of the fields that you have. Um, geospatial indexing, that came out uh, about a, a year or two ago, and that's pretty cool. Um, if, you, if any of you use Foursquare, that, they're leveraging that heavily. Um, but what do I mean when I say NoSQL? Um, it's n perhaps non-relational isn't the best way, because your data can be relational, but the server doesn't enforce that. Uh, the better way to say it is NoSQL, um, because it doesn't use SQL syntax you're querying for objects with properties. Yep, I mentioned, mentioned platforms. Yeah, you can, they, they maintain packages for, uh, for all the common package managers. Though honestly, if you're, uh, you know, if you're on Debian, Ubuntu, or you know, the Red Hat families, you're best to go to their, go on their website and they, they maintain their own repositories that are up to date. Whereas if any of you have used a package manager before, it's typically lagging behind pretty significantly. Um, they maintain a lot of popular languages, but there are seriously too many for me to mention that are community supported. There, that there are language drivers for just about everything out there. And if you find one that isn't, please contribute. Um, so here's a, a quick translation table to be, between terms from the, from the SQL world to MongoDB. You know, a database is still a database. A table is called a collection, but you can run show tables and it works. Um, instead of having a row, you have a document and it's, you know, again, that JSON object. You have fields. Um, joins is tricky because joins doesn't you can, that is one of the things that you cannot do in Mongo. You, you just cannot do a join. You can do it in your application layer, or you can set up your data model so that you do, actually I'm skipping ahead, but you can set up your data model so either uh, by ref or by embedding some of that data um, in your original field. Um, but here are some you know, basic SQL terms, SQL queries compared against their, uh, their equivalent MongoDB. And honestly, I like reading the Mongo better. That's just me. Um, these are some things that it's good at. Um, and really, anywhere that you're, anywhere where you may have a flexible schema, you may not know exactly what your app is going to look like, or you ha you have a web app where you have live customers, and you can't afford it. You know, you you need to do, run some updates to your application. You need to update your schema, but you can't take an outage. This is a very good alternative because you don't need to take an outage. There is no, there's no traditional schema that is enforced by the database. You just add a new object, or add an, add an object with a new property, or you append a property to an existing uh, document. Um, things that it's not good for. Uh, if you're doing a banking website, or if you're doing banking, your Mongo is not a good choice. Uh, it is not. Acid compliant, you can't like roll things back. It's um, if you need joins, it it's just not going to work. If for whatever reason that that is a core feature that you need for your application, it's not a good choice. And uh, data warehousing just honestly doesn't make sense um, because you're archiving old data. You know the fields that you have, 
So just go put that in something SQL. Um, another reason why that doesn't make sense is you know, you're be you'd be better off with uh, size-wise in warehousing. You'd be better off exporting CSVs and you know, gzipping them up because uh, in the, so you mentioned this, the, what each field is once and then each document is, each row is its own document and it falls into, into a nice grid. Um, this, you're mentioning the property and value every time, so that wastes space. On the other hand, to, the, to further along that spectrum, uh, this is much better than XML, especially transmitting over the wire, even if it was JSON and not BSON, because you don't have open and closed tags, it's just a property and a value, and there's a much higher data to, uh, data, or, you know, your values are all higher proportion than your keys. Um, so I mentioned this earlier, yeah, you know, it does not do joins. You design your, your data model with uh, by ref or by copying data periodically, or you can do it in application logic, which is personally what I prefer. Um, actually, this is wrong. So uh, a common complaint, and this is a legitimate one, is that MongoDB had a, the MongoD process had a global write lock. So anytime you had to, you had to write an object, the process had took, uh, took a lock on the disk and wouldn't release it until that's done. So if you have, this has been fixed, it's now per database, and in the next one or two versions, uh, we're on Mongo 2.2 right now, 2.4 is due to come out in the next few months, and within a year, 2.6 will be. Uh, in one of those, we'll have table level locking, and soon, uh, and the next thing after that, they will have document level locking. Those are in the works. Um, so the way to get, because Mongo is, or because it had a right, it still has a right lock, um, the way, the best way to do the, to get around that is and because it uses MMAP files, it, lets, it uses the kernel to determine what is, what is in active memory. The best thing to do when you need to write a, write a document is to query it first. Read it in, get it in at your active working set, and then you update it. Because then it's not, it's not putting a global, or when it's cold, you're reading a document cold. It needs to, it puts a lock on, it reads the file from disk into memory, uh, uh, makes your change, and then writes it out and then it releases. Um, whereas having it in memory, it saves that pulling it from disk first. It's a much shorter time um, with a global lock, with a write lock. I think um, recently they actually added support where they check if the page is in memory while they're holding the write lock, and so they don't fall while they're holding the write lock. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's in lots of things. Nice, thank you. Did everyone hear that? Uh, it's per database now. In the next one or two releases, it will be, uh, they're expecting to have table collection level locking, uh, down to collection level. Um, so queries are case sensitive. Um, one of these does not, equal, does not equal the other. Um, and, and to that note, it, you need to enforce within your team, your, your developers who are writing data out, that they they are consistent with their application with the the objects that they're writing. Make sure that you, you know, just put <clears throat> provide some kind of guideline as to how they should be writing their apps. Um, so further on the caveats, it can hold arbitrary numbers, so don't treat them as strings if they're not strings. Um, document sizes are capped at 16 meg, which is actually a lot of text. Uh, but that's not a complete stoppage. You just then need to implement gridfs, which is kind of a file system within it, and then it uh, it chunks out the objects onto disk, but it knows where they are. Um, if you, uh, unless you're concerned about 
about the return times from your application to come back, get grab the last error. Um, make sure that your your thing wrote and you know handle that exception. If it doesn't write, find out why and try to write it again. Um, using limits when using find. Now, um, this actually isn't as important as I think it may have once been. This, is, I think, is an old slide, so I apologize. Um, by default, well, when you're using the console, by default, it sets a cursor of 10 objects back, roughly. So, and uh, when using the JavaScript console, you, you, know, you type your query, and it'll give you some of them back. It, it acknowledges the existence of more, and if you run a, at a append a count to you know, how many results were there, It'll tell you how many of there were, but you just won't see them all at once. Um, there are a lot of cool tools that they have included. Um, you know, for one thing, that one of my gripes about Mongo is that, like, to rename a document or to rename a database, you need to stop the process, stop the MongoD process, and rename files on disk, which is kind of ghetto. Um, but they do have a lot of cool tools. That's uh, one of those, perhaps not low-hanging fruit, but less important things because there is an you know, easy workaround. Um, but MongoStat, it's kind of like top for, for Mongo. Um, DB.server status is pretty awesome too. It tells you, you know, what your replica sets are looking like. Um, and just you know, how healthy is it. You can do... Uh, on any given query, you can run and explain to see what, what it's actually going to try to do. And on your queries, if you have indexes that you're not sure or you just want to enforce um, that, that it leverages the index in, in what order, you can provide hints as well. Um, obviously, in your, in your monitoring and metrics, which of course everybody's doing, um, you want to look out for page faults for index misses and queue length. Um, there is a limit on the number of indexes you can do. Uh, by every document you add gets an ID, you know, underscore ID um, identifier, and that's automatically indexed. And I think you can do two more indexes. Um, so the goal there, of course, is to make sure you're indexing on things that actually matter that you will query for. Um, and of course, with any querying, you want to use those indexes to narrow down your working set. Your, your possible set as much as possible. Um, so, does anybody have questions so far? Um, so, what comment on get last error? Uh, on get last error, yes. I think they actually, with write concerns, you yep. don't need to call get last error if you specify a write concern that is um, requires it to have been acknowledged by the server or one of the other sets. But I think it still does. Well, I don't think you need it, but it's yeah, um, yeah it's less important then, mm -hmm. but it still returns a uh, return code. Okay. Right? Oh, I so I actually don't use Mongo, but oh, okay. I read about it a lot. Okay. Um, I think it interests in database APIs. Um, and yeah, everybody has a hobby. Yeah. So <laughs> um, yeah, I think write concerns were meant to replace that because the problem with get last error is it does the extra round trip. Right. That is true. And so I think they were, were looking to fix that. Okay. Um, so at this point, I have, I have some data set up, and I could, if we want, I can do a live demo. Um, I'm going to cheat and copy and paste commands I've already set up, but because this is not a test of my typing, but I'd rather show you guys how. how yeah. Um, have you built any Mongo apps? I have, but I've. Most of my time has been spent as a systems engineer backing them. Or, or work with people who build yep. Mongo. Something I'm curious about. Yes. Um, so if I have two clients connected to a Mongo server, Yep. and let's say I'm doing an Amazon.com type app, so one client I want to get a, a list of products that meet a certain criteria, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of items, so I'm going to allow for pagination. Okay. And so my first client goes out to retrieve rows and gets the first batch of 20. And the second client is attached and actually does an insert update or delete them on the collection. Um, when that first client goes back again and again and again, it might, it might end up picking up work, you know, items, for example, that weren't really there when I started my initial query. 
if they're in memory, they'll be returned. But if they're removed from disk or the work, you know, removed from active memory or the disk, then I imagine like that's a well, typical not, race condition problem. It's but it's not behaving like what, what I'm calling normal data. Excuse me. It's not. It's not giving me like a read consistent view of every row, every document that then my my find operation because it's there. There really is a you know, transaction wise. There's no way to have a snapshot. Reader. Right. So what I'm curious about is how do people program around that kind of limitation? Well, I don't. You know, I don't have an answer for you. Um, but I don't know. I honestly don't know how it handles two operations that would directly impact one another and. For some reason, I want to say that they handle, they don't handle them concurrently. They, they wait for one to finish before the other one takes effect. Um, but I don't know, you know, you would have to decide within your development team how you would handle, like, a, a search has returned an object, and then it got deleted in the next operation. Um, you know, this, this object, is, this, this item in my store is no longer available for sale. You know, I'm sorry, customer. I honestly think you would have to prototype that out and see what the actual behavior is, because I can't give you an answer on that. Okay. Um, so would we like to see a live demo? Yay, demo, demo. <laughs> okay. We have, we have about half an hour, so. Oh, great. I, I'm not sure if I heard you. Does it have MapReduce? Can, can you show MapReduce to demo? I cannot, no. <laughs> I, I haven't done much with MapReduce. They do have that, and uh, they also have an aggregation framework that's newly added. So you don't need to do MapReduce for everything. But um, I don't know MapReduce well enough to demonstrate that. But they have excellent docs. Uh, massive cop out. All right. So again, like I said, I am not testing my typing today. So I have a, a preset Mongo process. I'm establishing a database path um, where I want the data files to be stored there, and I want my logs to write there. Um, obvious, as in, it makes perfect sense to have your, if possible, have your logs and journal, if you're using it, live on a separate spindle set than your, uh, than your database. Um, and I am specifying a TCP port that is not open to everyone, but um, the default is 27017. And I already have a file there, but it's listening now. I'm going to start up my Mongo client. Um, so now I'm going to run show DBs. And you can see it's an empty database. Uh, empty database. If you went to my GitHub project, there is, this is a schedule. Um, this instance, is, it is highly normalized data. This could very easily go into a relational SQL database. Um, and, you know, there, many of the, some of these talks don't have titles and you could very easily in your, in your relational model, uh, your relational schema, you can just make those option, that field optional. Um. Oops, so let me just start the process. And so I'm going to run a Mongo import. That takes that can take many different types of files off the top of my head. I think you can take a, a BSON dump. Um, you can take JSON. You can take CSVs. Um, I don't remember what other options are there, but man, Mongo import works very well. Um, I'm going to 
uh, Mongo handles database and collection uh, references as implicit creates if they don't exist. So I don't need to do a an implicit create me a database. Going, I'm going to make with a dash D. I'm going to create import it into a database called Nelf 2013 into a con, uh, collection called Schedule, specifying a type and of course the files path. And it is just that easy. So now I oh, go back to my Mongo client and show DBs. We now have a Nelf 2013 with a very small database. Um, it, the text is not actually 200 meg. It's just padded out the files on disk to be that fi that size, and it writes it overwrites the files that have already been allocated. to use Nelf 2013, show collections, and again we get a we get a set of indexes and a uh, this also works as uh, show tables. I should be copy and pasting. But to show everything we do um, DB dot your table name dot find with parens and it gives me you know the top n I forgot how many are here documents that are returned and it provides me a cursor so I can hit it and do more um, oh again this is the Mongo shell can everyone see that can anyone not see that okay um, this is the Mongo shell it's uh, I forgot what JavaScript engine they're using, but they're going to be using uh, V8 pretty soon, I think in the next release. Um, this is a fine tool for looking at your data and, you know, tossing some, doing occasional work on it, but don't code to this in real life apps. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? Can anybody figure out what this data set is? Thank you, Sherry. Invite list for a party of dwarves. What's that? The invite list for a party of dwarves in the Shire. That is a possibility. <laughs> uh, invite list to a, a party for dwarves in the Shire. Um, this is scheduled for a conference. That's happening right now. It's on GitHub with all your changes. It is on GitHub with all of my... Uh, right as I know them changes <laughs> it is correct true and correct to the best of my knowledge which uh, will not hold up in a court of law um, so if we want to see you can uh, what do I want to say oh being pretty much arbitrary JavaScript commands you can throw anything you want at it but some of the built-ins are you know we can do count and I know there are 35 sessions that were scheduled with, you know, titles and names and and such that I was able to create. Um, well, I hate the way you wrote that out, so we can prettify that and make them look, you know, like traditional prettified uh, JSON documents. Um, I don't have any nesting here, but it, you can you can have JavaScript arrays in there and go up as far down as you want. Um, also, if you don't provide any argument, you leave off the parens, or when you inevitably forget it or just type fast, um, it will tell you what, your, uh, what that command is actually going to do. So let's... So here I'm going to create a new arbitrary object. Now I just you know, declared a variable and said these are its properties. 
I can do db.users.insert. And it, um, again, with the implicit uh, collection creation, it creates a, a, t a user's table and inserts an object in it. Just for gits and shiggles, we create another one. Or we set it and then we create it. We find we now have two objects. I feel like this is very boring. Is there something I can be doing that's less boring? Okay. Does that, mean it's does that mean it's fine or no, this just does not get any better? Because, dear God, you're showing off a database and expecting people to be entertained. Um, so I created a new user, Bob Hope, and I managed to get his email address and phone number. Um, I don't expect that this is actually, will reach you the Mr. Bob Hope, but you can, we can now see, Just by uh, doing an update, I now have. Ooh, I did it wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I know why. <laughs> That's why. Uh, because I. Uh, because the object ID is wouldn't have been correct. When I created the Bob Hope object, I was hoping that I would notice in my notes that this was wrong because ah. there. No. Okay, I'm bad at this. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, thank you for saving me. <laughs> yeah, this amount of data and a very predictable schema for a, a conference schedule you can very easily do this in any kind of uh, relational model. If you're doing, um, if you're participating, especially in Agile or Scrum development methodologies where you're doing rapid development, you don't know, you don't have an, a specified end goal and things are changing day by day or week by week, um, those are good when you, those are good examples of where you might want to use Mongo with its non-enforced schema. Um, another place, maybe when you need to make those kinds of changes, and you, uh, oh, excuse me, you need to make those changes, but you can't take an outage, and you're not, you know, you don't have, perhaps you don't have the expertise to set up a highly resilient, um, highly redundant, like scaling horizontally, uh, relational infrastructure. You know, MySQL makes makes it possible. You know, master slave is easy, but beyond that, it gets pretty. It gets pretty hairy. Um, Mongo makes it really simple to do replication, you know, to have your replica sets, but also to have sharding, which I, uh, so you, you scale down for replica sets for safety and if you want, for, uh, for adding read, uh, high speed read capabilities. But you scale horizontally with sharding to add right, uh, to add when you need to scale up your writing. And what it does is you provide a shard key or one or more shard keys, and your your new Mongo S process manages what parts of the cluster are holding that set of memory. So you you get you know n number of as many shards as you have, you get n number more write paths that again lock individually and just that much more throughput. Um, 
because multi-master replication is hard. Um, and, um, in I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, simultaneous modification of the same type of two different things. How does it resolve in common? One happens after the other because the same shard, same set of sharding is going to have that single object. Like only one person is going to have that. Well, when you say multi-master, sometimes multi-master replication. Well, you use it. So each shard has a separate master. So it's master slave. You you split out you split out your entire working set. You don't have a master a, a writable master with the entire data set and a met, uh, master with it. You chunk it out into different groups. So, so that in the single piece of data is only Correct. Yep. Okay. And then within your your shard masters, you have a replica set within that. So. So you still have your yeah you still have your redundancy you can still add your read um, your other read nodes um, um, on replica sets by default slave uh, the, the secondaries not slaves the, the secondaries are not readable from but in your application driver like you know in Ruby when you es establish your DB connection you say I want uh, I want to be able to read from the secondaries. Um, the concern there, the only thing to, the thing to be aware about there is the same with any replication. You may hit a, a secondary before it's gotten the most recent update. Um, but the laws of physics haven't fixed that. The uh, speed of light only goes so fast. Um, there's going to be a second lag when you call someone on a satellite phone. Um, are there any other questions? Yes. Can you, who's using this practice? Who's using it? Uh, Tengen has a whole lot of their customers. Off the top of my head, I can say parts of eBay are using this. I think some of Netflix. Craigslist is a big customer. Foursquare, you, Craigslist and Foursquare use this uh, almost exclusively. Uh, obviously not for their data warehousing. Craigslist has, uh, has given a good talk on that. Um, there was a... Um, Tengen has a really good presentation site, uh, tengen.com slash presentations, and they have a whole bunch of slides and pre uh, present talks that people have given. There was one recently called uh, MongoDB from a DevOps perspective, and being that I care about DevOps philosophy, I went straight to it. Um, it, it was a, a web-based fitness app. I don't, I don't know the app myself, obviously, um, but it... Uh, they they talk very intelligently about the uh, about some of the, the positives, but also the pitfalls they've run into in using Mongo. Like for instance, um, I usually recommend people to avoid sharding unless you need to. They they didn't shard and they didn't go to or uh, by the time they went to sharding, it was much later than they should have. Their data set had grown so large that. Um, you know, you can you can go from an uncharted to a sharded environment uh, live on the fly, but you are going to take I/O hits because it is moving objects over in in real time. So you know you have to deal with the I/O of that um, happening in place. You could you could say take a uh, take your a member of your rep your replica set, instantiate a new instant, you know, separate it from there, create a new. Um, sharding environment and then cut over to that, but you have to deal with all the usual, you know, how to handle the data that's come in in the meantime. Um, I forgot, did I answer your question? Okay. And I started rambling. Does anybody else have any questions? Oh, and thank you, sir, for speaking. Uh, you, you gave the B tree talk earlier? Yeah, thank you for speaking intelligently about. One interesting gotcha that I, I don't know if you have on your slide, but just looking at the screen right now, yeah. upper left hand corner, and something Mongo blogged about recently. We're, we're adding a fresh to Mongo. A scary part of Mongo for the, the new user is that object, first name Bob, last name Bob, username Pico. Mongo actually stores something that looks a lot like that string. So as he's defined his schema, that document is taking up more space on disk for field names than it is field values. 
Yep. It, it's interesting, like, they have, one of their best practices is you probably want to use, like, F name, L name, yep. U name, or F N. You know, really, the, the more descriptive you are in field names, the yep. worse it is from a storage perspective. I would argue that's a beauty of video names, right? They, they blog, they comment on the blog. I think it's, they don't have a choice but to suggest that because of how they store data, but there are some gotchas when you, you put a billion objects into that table. And just going down to FN instead of the first name, you might reduce the size of your, you're on this size by 50%. Right. Well, that's, yeah. The field name, again, again, again. again. And, and that's exactly what I, what I uh, was mentioning earlier, where you have like a CSV or a traditional table format. You establish what that column, yeah, that column is once, and everything that falls under it has, is that value. Um, and, you know, JSON falls in the middle, but, you know, XML, you have, you have that tag twice for each for each uh, sub object, um, but yeah, thank you for that point, uh, ma'am. Is there a way you can, with the objects already being stored, is there a way that you could realize, oh, I should have used F name instead of first name, and actually update that? You tag can. Or, or you can upsert it, but you, there's no like, there's no shortcut to it. Um, you could do. Uh, yeah, you, you're pulling and popping. Yeah. Um, now, I mean, you could change that in, I believe, in a relational, you would typically, like, create a new table with the same, with a updated schema, and you would copy the data over and drop the old one. You can just rename it. Okay, thank you. I can't hear you, sir. Yeah, the, that's what she said. I've spent more time in Mongo than I have in, in my sequence. Yes. You. Yeah. 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 Yes. Absolutely. Um, and there are a lot of, there. Are, I don't have any of them uh, applied here, but there are some cool projects out there that um, you can hack your, um, your Mongo shell indefinitely. Um, there's one, I think it's called, a, there's a GitHub project called Mongo, Mongo Pack, where he adds all kinds of syntax highlighting, a lot of helper functions and things like that. It's pretty neat. I just haven't applied it on this machine. Um, so are, are there any other questions? Is there anything else anybody would like to see? Okay, thank you very much. And if you, uh, you know what? There was something I wanted to show. Oh, the object IDs are guaranteed to be globally unique amongst your amongst your data set. So whether it's the set, your your Mongo process, your replica set, or your shard, um, you can override this. I'm sorry. Uh, when you create create a document, this this uh, value is automatically created an underscore ID, um, and it's a, a large string. There's a schema to it, but I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. Um, but it's automatically indexed. And you can overwrite that when you create your documents, but you do need to be sure that your, the thing you're overriding it with is at least as unique. I'm sorry? Oh, yes. Uh, 12, 12, 16. Yes, that could actually be bigger than the rest of your data. But you're going to lose unique. You would, regardless of, you know, after the smaller size, the less unique any of them are going to be. Um, like I said earlier, you know, that's just a shell. It's a great administration tool. It's great for playing around, but don't try to build real apps in it or you'll go crazy. Again, the officially supported languages. Um, I know I, I touched on a lot of things, but you know this is only a half hour quick introduction. Um, I encourage you to play with it. It's very, very readily, you know, very play friendly. Um, oh, I do want to mention the security model. Right, right now it's kind of it's weak. They 
they make the re recommendation and assumption that you are in a protected environment. There is local authentication per, per MongoD process, I think. Um, it creates a new you know, uh, user admin table and you create, you create user accounts. Um, in, in the works is more robust authentication and permission model, mostly because their clients are demanding it. So there will be things, there are things expected like LDAP authentication and rights assignment that to be coming down the road, but right now it's assumed that you're gonna be in a protected environment. Um, so the documentation, as I say in the slide, is awesome. Um, but contributions are, of course, welcome. Um, and it's a GitHub project, so just fork it, make your fork it, make your changes, and submit a pull request. Um, they have, like I mentioned earlier, the presentations on TenGen's website. There are people made it much more cogent than I. Um, Christina Chodoro wrote has written two of two of them um, O'Reilly books on MongoDB, and she has a blog called Snail and the Turtleneck. Um, she gives ex she's a software engineer for Tengen, and she gives excellent descriptions of how things actually work, and examples of how to you know things to play with or try out. Um, highly recommended, very you know down to earth and nerd culture friendly. Uh, I think the most recent one references Dungeons and Dragons heavily. Um, play with it. Talk with talk about it. So again, uh, if you want to troll me hard, I am Gmoldo on Twitter and GitHub and pretty much everywhere. But thank you very much, and I hope you have a good day.